Dr. Hunt is currently a professor of theology and scripture at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, where he has taught since 1990 and is the founder and director of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. And in 2005, he was appointed as the inaugural chair of biblical theology and liturgical proclamation at St. Vincent Seminary in our own Latrobe, Pennsylvania. And as most of you already know, he's also a star on EWTN television network. So without further ado, I give you the man of the hour, Dr. Scott Hahn. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father Peterson. Thank you, brothers and sisters in Christ, for joining me this day. It is a great joy and honor for me to be able to come out, and it's also a great joy, but a smaller one, to be able to get up at 4.30 in the morning <laughs> to make it in time to the Pittsburgh airport to be here. I, uh, I drove Route 22 towards Pittsburgh. I grew up in Pittsburgh, and so it's always kind of fun, like, coming home. But it was reminding me of another trip I took to Pittsburgh a couple of years ago to visit a friend who was in the hospital. But the problem was he was in Mercy Hospital. And growing up Protestant in Pittsburgh, all I knew was where Presbyterian Hospital was. <laughs> so I went off assuming that I could find it because it was downtown, and then I got lost as soon as I arrived. I drove around the block two or three times and finally got enough, enough courage to do what most of us men find it so hard to do. I asked for directions. I said, where is Mercy Hospital? And the, the guy looked at me and he said, you're almost there. And I said, I realize that, but I'm, I'm lost. He said, well, just turn down pride and you'll find mercy. <laughs> and I'm thinking, smart aleck, you know, what's he talking about? He walked away and I look up and the street sign reads Pride Avenue. <laughs> and so I turned down pride and sure enough, I found mercy. <laughs> I love to reflect upon that because when I got up to Father Ronald's room, I told him how I found him. I had to turn down pride in order to find mercy. He looked at me and he said, Scott, that's the story of my life as a priest. <laughs> and I would have to say it's the story of mine as well. It always reminds me of another story. In fact, it's my favorite story in the Bible. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Luke 24. And if you don't, just look on with the Protestant sitting next to you or the convert, as the case may be. I'm on a campaign to teach cradle Catholics the true meaning of BYOB. That's right, it's Bible, not beer, right. Well, even if you don't have a Bible, I think you know the story well enough to kind of follow along. Here are these two men, Clopas and his friend, and they're walking from Jerusalem on the road to Emmaus. And they're walking and they're talking and they're very dejected. Suddenly a stranger meets up with them, and of course we know who it is, but they don't. They were prevented from recognizing him, we read. And so he asks them, what are you talking about? Are you the only one who doesn't know? About what? About Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet mighty in word and deed. And they go on to describe the events of the last few days, how he was arrested, he was tried, he was executed. And we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day and some women from our company came back and told us they'd found the tomb empty. So he is going along with them, walking on this long, winding road. I've been on that road. It's about a seven-mile trip, but it's a long and difficult journey, so they probably had lots of time. And as Jesus is listening, as the men describe, finally he gets a chance to respond, and he responds in rather startling terms. He, he said to them, Foolish men and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things before he entered into his glory? And so beginning with Moses in the law and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That is a talk I wish I could have heard. That is a talk I wish could have been televised and taped and distributed but alas, they drew near to the village of Emmaus. He was going on. They convinced him to stay and join them for a meal. And when he was at table with them, he does something. He actually does four things. 
The four verbs that Luke tells us are familiar verbs. He took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and then he gave it to them. And what happened? Suddenly, their eyes were opened. And they recognized him at once, and suddenly he vanished out of their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened up the scriptures? And they got up that hour and walked all the way back to Jerusalem, found the eleven, and reported to them what had happened. Their hearts had been burning within them as he opened up the scriptures, but they reported, our eyes were opened in what? The breaking of the bread. That phrase, breaking of the bread, is a very important phrase because it means more than a meal. Later on, when Luke writes his sequel to the gospel, the book of Acts, in chapter 2, 42, and several other places, for example, in Acts 20, breaking of the bread becomes the formula for describing what? The celebration of the Holy Eucharist. And so it is that here in Luke 24, we get a sense of what was happening, that the scriptures were opened, the law and the prophets, and Christ was showing how it all pointed to him. But still, for hours, presumably, they were prevented from recognizing him. Until what? Until their eyes were open in the breaking of the bread. And if I were to kind of summarize 10 years of my life experience, I couldn't find a better way than to apply the same story to what I experienced shortly after experiencing the grace of conversion. I was what you'd call a juvenile delinquent. And I don't want to go into the details. My mother always appreciates that when I'm quiet about what I did. But I got out of juvenile court, and very shortly afterwards, I, I found the Savior. I went on a retreat, and I heard the most amazing good news I had ever heard in my life. This speaker explained that Jesus paid a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. And who wouldn't want to cash in on that? Only it wasn't about money. It was about the free gift of salvation. It was free, but it sure wasn't cheap. It cost our Savior's life. And so I wanted in exchange and out of gratitude to give our Lord my life, and so I did. And very soon afterwards, I embarked upon Scripture study. I began just reading it privately. And I was told by my youth minister that that is really fine that the private interpretation of the Bible, the Holy Spirit moves individuals, and so I began reading it, but I must admit I got confused because I wasn't exactly sure how best to read it. And so when I heard about a Bible study, I eagerly enrolled. I went every Wednesday night down the street about two miles to a Bible study with about 25 people, and we were studying the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation the prophecy of John concerning the Antichrist, the rapture, the end of time, or so we were told. And so we were coming week after week, kind of programmed to expect the prophecies to be fulfilled in a matter of days, if not weeks, maybe months, but probably not years. And so while we were reading the apocalypse, we were also keeping our eyes glued on the TV for the 6 o'clock news and the headlines because we were quite certain that the Antichrist was right around the corner. And we wanted to be ready for the rapture. We wanted to be taken up to the clouds so we wouldn't have to suffer seven years of tribulation, which was what all the unbelievers would experience because they would be left behind. You recognize those words? Unbelievers left behind, including you Catholics, I'm sorry to say. At least that's what we were taught. And so for my own private reading of Scripture, I dove into the prophecies of John in the last book of the Bible. And after months of this, I realized that nothing had happened. Not that I was eager to see the Antichrist, but I was ready for the rapture. But none of that happened. Summer came, I had played baseball, and to be honest, I forgot about the rapture and the Antichrist. That fall, I I found out about another, another Bible study, and so a couple of my friends and I would drive down the, about three, four miles, and sure enough, guess what book of the Bible they were tackling? In a different church, with a different teacher, the same prophecy of John and the Apocalypse. And so we heard a different take on the Antichrist and the rapture and the battle of Armageddon and the second coming and all the rest, and after a couple more months, I grew, quite honestly, discouraged. 
and disenchanted because not only had the prophecies not been fulfilled, but I discovered there were serious differences and contradictions between two men who were obviously very spirit-filled and very sincere, and yet there they were giving us their private interpretation of the scriptures, and they flatly contradicted each other. So I moved on. I found greener pastures to graze in. We call them the four gospels. You know, I wanted to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and just go back to the basics. And so I did. In fact, what I decided to do about a year after my conversion was to read through the Bible, beginning in Genesis, not Revelation. And, and so I did. It took about a year, but I was enthralled with what I was studying, but still confused by what I was reading. And so before I graduated, way back in 75, I read through it a second time. I actually began a third time when I went off after graduation, played guitar in a band for three months and toured the 35 states and all of Europe, and I got music out of my system so I could really get serious about Scripture. I went off to college to study theology, philosophy, and since my father was paying tuition, I added economics as a third major. <laughs> he wanted something practical and employable at the end, you know. But I had a dream come true in those four years because I finally had a chance to study Greek so I could read the New Testament in the original language. My friends and I all took beginner Greek. After a year, they dropped out. I went on. I ended up taking advanced Greek, studying under this Oxford tutor who my fourth and final year turned on me and she said, for your senior project, I want you to translate the entire book of Revelation. <laughs> 22 chapters of some of the hardest Greek and so I went at it, week in and week out, until finally, after months, I translated all 22 chapters, only to discover that the word antichrist never appeared a single time. In fact, the rapture doesn't either. Even the phrase, the second coming, doesn't occur once in the entire book. I didn't understand exactly what it meant, but at least I knew what it didn't mean. I mean, the Battle of Armageddon is only mentioned once near the very end of the book, and so all of these sensationalistic private interpretations that promised us that we were the ones lucky enough to be alive at the end of time proved to really be broken promises, empty. And so I was considering at the time going off to seminary to prepare for ministry. I was already falling in love with the most beautiful gal on campus. And I decided to do something very daring, propose marriage. We were graduating together, and so I was hopeful. I like to say that God sometimes gives sight to the blind and takes it away from those who see because she accepted my proposal. <laughs> we graduated together, got married that summer, and after our honeymoon in Florida, we packed up a U-Haul and drove off to Boston, where we both began a master's program in theology at Gordon-Conwell Seminary, which is one of the finest seminaries in the world. And there I had a second dream come true because now I could learn Hebrew. So I could read the Old Testament in the original language just like I had with the New. But I also discovered a much more serious way of studying Scripture. Because besides private interpretation and prophecy, I had learned something else in our youth group and that was called proof texting. We had memorized about 15 or 20 verses of the Bible. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For God so loved the world that He gave. And all of these other texts these texts we would use in evangelizing unbelievers, including you Catholics, <laughs> because we consider all of you to be stuck in superstition, stuck in a lot of error that wasn't found in the Bible. And so I'd have to say I was very, very anti-Catholic. It wasn't bigotry or prejudice. It was actually the result of studying Scripture, but also accepting profound distortions of what the Catholic Church actually taught but I didn't know that they were distortions. I thought they were an accurate reflection of what, in fact, Catholics really believed. And I have to admit, my Catholic friends didn't help a lot. Because when I would approach them and say, where do you find Mary in the Bible? Where do you find the Eucharist? Where do you find the Pope? You know, they'd shrug their shoulders and just kind of change the subject. And so proof texting was, for me, the way that you would reach unbelievers, including these Catholics. But in seminary, we heard a professor say something rather disturbing. I think about half of us in that seminar were a little taken off. We were caught off guard because he said, and I'll never forget this, that a text taken out of context and used as a proof text is a pretext. 
And I thought back to the dozens of verses that I had learned, I had memorized, I had shared dozens, hundreds of times, but without ever really looking closely at those texts in context. And only in seminary did I discover that we would often import meanings to those texts that would be useful for sharing that weren't necessarily part of the context at all. So I was divested of this approach that was rooted in my own private interpretation that would often kind of fixate on prophecy, but would always kind of gravitate back to proof texting. And so I was wondering, well, what do you do when it comes to reading the Bible? How do you read the text in its context? Does that just mean backing up a chapter? No. One of my professors insisted that what it really means is studying any given text in the context of the whole New Testament. And he even went so far as to say, you're going to have to read the Old Testament because that's what the New Testament writers were immersed in. And I'm thinking, what a tall order. How do you begin? Because all of my favorite professors, world-class scholars, not only Bible teachers but preachers who could really make the text come alive, all of them were either Old Testament experts or New Testament specialists. So my third and final year, I was really delighted to find a, a group of writers from the early church known as the fathers of the church who weren't New Testament specialists or Old Testament experts. They seemed to really read the whole Bible. Whenever they were looking at a given text, they would step back and look at it in its context. I remember, for example, St. Augustine looking at Jesus and showing how Paul explains our Lord's redemptive work in terms of Adam's sin. St. Augustine points out that the word in Romans 5, verse 14, describing Adam was typos, that Adam was a type of him who was to come. So for the early church fathers studying the types in the Old Testament that prepared for Jesus in the New was really the key, the master key that would unlock all of it. And I was curious, and so what did that mean? Well, for St. Augustine, it was quite clear that Jesus came not only to undo what Adam did, but to do what Adam should have done. And so Augustine opened my eyes to something that I, sh I should have known. I should have seen the connections, but I hadn't until the early fathers kind of showed me that just like Adam went to a garden, so Jesus went to a garden. And just as Adam was tested in the garden, so was Jesus tested in the garden of Gethsemane. But whereas Adam failed miserably by going to the wrong tree and sinning and releasing the curse, Jesus, of course, passes by going to the right tree. The cross is called the tree in the New Testament. The fathers called it the tree of life. Wow. And so he undid what Adam did. He did what Adam should have done. When Adam sinned, he triggered the curse, which was what? Well, it was sweat. It was thorns. It was the dust of death. And so St. Augustine showed us that in the garden, what did Jesus do? He sweat great drops of blood. And after his arrest, he wore a crown of what? Thorns. That was no accident. And then he was delivered to the dust of death, naked, as it were. And so Jesus was bearing the curse of Adam, but you really couldn't grasp what the evangelists were saying, no matter how many times I'd read it, until you recognized what they were doing. They were seeing Adam as a type, a typos, of Christ who was to come. This was called typology, the study of how the New Testament is concealed in the Old, as Augustine said, and the Old Testament is revealed and fulfilled in the New. And as soon as I discovered this, I realized this is what I've been looking for. This is not taking text out of context and using as proof text. This is reading the whole context of Scripture. But they weren't done. I was keeping notes in a notebook, really studying not only Augustine, but St. John Chrysostom, St. Ephraim, St. Jerome, St. Cyprian. And they were all completely fluent in this way of reading the old and the new. They seemed to be experts in both, but in connecting them as well. And another Another key event besides creation was the exodus when Israel came into existence out of Egyptian bondage. This was really, the, this was like the next major mountain peak 
that the early church fathers drew from in order to explain Jesus. I couldn't believe how I knew both sets of stories, but I'd never seen the convergences or parallels. I mean, everybody knows that when God sent Jesus, he sent, he sent us a Savior. But when Jesus was born, the Savior needed to be saved. Why? Because of the imperial decree of Herod that threatened not only the infant Jesus, but all of the Hebrew male children there in Bethlehem. Well, for the early fathers, this wasn't a first, this was a second. You go back to the 1400s BC, and there you will find God sending a Savior to save Israel from Egyptian slavery, named Moses. But when the Savior was born, the Savior needed to be saved because of the Pharaoh's imperial decree that not only targeted infant baby Moses, but all of the Hebrew male children as well. So what did God do? Well, back then he found a man named Joseph who was just, who had dreams, and so he made provisions for God's family, Israel, where? Of all places in Egypt. And so the early fathers kind of connected that with a set of dots, that there was another man named Saint Joseph, who's described as being just, who had dreams, and who made provisions for Mary and Jesus, the holy family, where? Of all places in Egypt. And so when the Pharaoh died, Moses led Israel, God's family, out of Egypt, through the water, with the Spirit guiding, they went into the desert where he proceeded to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. That's what Lent is all about. And then suddenly you go back to Matthew's Gospel, and when Herod dies, what happens? The Holy Family is brought out of Egypt. Jesus goes through the water of the Jordan. The Spirit leads him into the desert where he proceeded to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. I knew both sets of stories. I just never connected the dots. For the early church fathers, this wasn't advanced theological research. These were Sunday homilies. These were what ordinary Catholics were getting week after week for months, for years, their whole lifetimes. In the first five, six, seven centuries, they were immersed in scriptural preaching that was both the old and the new. And I discovered, just like Jesus and Adam, so with Jesus and Moses, there were even more parallels. Not just the birth and the deliverance from Egypt, not just the walking, you know, going through the water and then being led into the desert, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. They just kept coming up with more and more, and I just kept keeping track and jotting them down in my notebook. I remember another homily where Augustine went on to show how after fasting for 40 days and for 40 nights, during which time Israel was tested, Moses gave them the law. Jesus, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he too was tempted, but he passed those tests that Israel had failed. And why? Well, I knew why, because he quoted the Bible. But Augustine pointed out, so did the devil. But Jesus didn't just quote from the Bible. He didn't just take a text out of context. Augustine opened my eyes to the fact that Jesus went straight to Deuteronomy, chapters 6 through 8. All three times he answered the devil's temptations, he quoted from Moses where Moses had corrected Israel for having failed. Because man doesn't live by bread alone. Not even if it's the, the miracle bread we call manna. You live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And you should worship the Lord and him alone, not that golden calf you made while I was atop of Sinai. And you shall not put the Lord your God to the test, Moses said, and Jesus quoted, especially when the Lord God is in the process of testing you. Jesus seemed to know exactly where to go and what to quote. And the early church fathers had the New Testament text and the Old Testament context, and it was fluent. It was something that was so natural, it was almost matter of fact the way they would preach it and teach it. And yet I had straight A's. I was about two months away from graduating at the top of my class, having studied under specialists in the old and the new with Hebrew and Greek, and yet these dots were still mostly unconnected for me. And for my friends as well. I remember sitting down with my, with my brother-in-law, who's a Baptist minister now, and we would talk about this and wonder why we had never really spent much time reading the Fathers. He was busy with a job, I had more spare time, and so I spent every spare minute reading the Fathers, keeping track of how they would make the Bible come alive even more than my favorite preachers and teachers. But I was getting closer to graduation. Bill had another year left, and so I was feeling the pressure because in a matter of weeks, I was going to have to get up every Sunday and do what? Preach. And I was hired by 
Trinity Church in Fairfax, Virginia, and when I sat down with them and they told me what they expected, I was told point blank, you will preach for at least 30 minutes every Sunday, and preferably 45 to 50. And by now, you can tell that isn't very difficult for me. <laughs> But I wasn't sure back then exactly what I'd preach, but then it occurred to me, I've got to keep reading the Fathers and sharing with my congregation what I'm learning. But I was still a three or four weeks away from graduation, still reading these sermons, still keeping track, still finding myself getting excited more and more. I remember, you know, Moses, after 40 days of fasting, got, got the law of God, the law of the covenant on top of Sinai. And then Augustine points out the obvious. I never seen it. That after 40 days of fasting, during which time Jesus is tested and he succeeds, at the end of that, he gets the law of the new covenant, just like Moses got the old. And he gave it to all of the people, and we call it the Sermon on the Mount. There's a new mountain. There's a new Moses. There's a new law. There's a new covenant. And as he says in Matthew 5, 17, the new doesn't abolish the old. It fulfills it. And it was that pattern of promise and fulfillment that found, I just found it so engrossing. And then Augustine would go on, Jerome too, Ephraim, I was reading Cyprian and others too. I can't even keep track back then and I can't recall exactly who said what, but I was just so eager to find more connections that the fathers were showing me that even after Moses got the divine law on top of Sinai, he still needed assistance. And so he was... He was inspired to choose from the 12 tribes, 12 princes to assist him in governing Israel. Well, when Jesus is done with the Sermon on the Mount and there are thousands of followers, what does he do? He chooses assistance. And how many? 12. What a coincidence. He even told them, you'll sit on 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. You know, it reminded me of what Mark Twain once wrote. History, he said, does not repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme a lot. And it was that rhyme scheme that I was hearing for the first time and just seeing the old and the new come together in Christ in a new way, in an exciting way. So even with the help of the 12 princes, Moses still found it difficult. So on one occasion, he appointed 70 elders. He anointed them with his spirit to assist him in the 12. And then the Father showed me what I should have seen before, but I hadn't. That Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, the labors are few, so on that occasion, what does he do? He appoints how many? Huh? Seventy additional disciples, anointing them with the Spirit to assist him and the twelve in proclaiming the gospel. And they come back. Even the demons are subject to us in your name. So Jesus is a new Moses. This is a new covenant, a new law. There's a whole new Israel. And so as I was following this, another sermon explained how even with all of that help, Moses grew weary. He had to pray. We all do. So on one occasion he went off and spent a day alone in prayer. He climbed a mountain, but he took three who were close to him. And on one occasion, Nadab, Abihu, and his own brother Aaron went up where Moses was in the presence of God, and they witnessed this spectacular transformation of Moses' face. He came back. Later they, they encouraged him to put on a veil. It was so hard to look upon his bright countenance. Well, what does that remind us of, obviously? Jesus also had to recharge his batteries. He had to spend time in prayer. On one occasion, he spent the whole day, climbed the mount, but he took what? Three who were closest, Peter, James, and John, and they witnessed the transfiguration. And they also happened to witness the appearance of Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets pointing to Jesus. Moses gave Israel the law, Elijah the greatest of Israel's prophets, and the only two men to have fasted for 40 days like our Lord. So there they are on top of the mountain, and St. Jerome pointed out, Augustine also, what were they talking about? Well, there's Peter saying, let's build tents, let's make it a weekend, let's just stick around. Jesus is like, don't mind him, you know, he doesn't get it. But here's Jesus talking to Moses about his departure, which was soon to take place in Jerusalem. The Greek word for departure, used by the evangelist, is exodos. You don't even need one semester of Greek to hear that one, you know. Here is Jesus talking to Moses, not about the old exodus from Egypt, but about an imminent exodus from Jerusalem. That had to get Moses wondering. At least that's what I thought. I mean, who else is Jesus talking to but Mr. Exodus himself, you know? 
And if Moses had bothered to check his notes, he would have seen how many parallels and convergences. You know, he might have said, well, I, I performed signs first before the Exodus. And I, I turned water into blood, the water of the Nile, the water of the, the stone jars in Exodus 7.19. But Augustine pointed out that Jesus' first sign was what? To turn water into wine. The water in the stone jar is the same term used in Exodus 7 for Moses' sign. Now, if Moses said, well, I turn into blood, I remember reading Augustine. Augustine seemed to quip, well, keep your eyes on that wine. Jesus is not finished with that yet. By the time the new Passover rolls around, that wine will be blood. And I remember thinking, whoa, wine, blood. That almost sounds Catholic, you know. Wine is wine, you know. Whoa, you know. And so while I was trying to recover from that kind of crypto-Catholic shock, you know, I began to bump into more examples of that kind of thing where the early church fathers seemed to interpret the scriptures in a much deeper and more coherent way. But, you know, as I was getting closer to graduation, I noticed two or three other things coming up Catholic. And I was a little disturbed, but hey, it's just too good. I'm, I'm more pro-Bible than I am anti-Catholic, so I'm not going to write them off just yet. I remember after graduating, packing up a U-Haul again, moving to Virginia, beginning to preach Sunday after Sunday, I let it rip. I let loose on them what I had been learning myself, and within three or four weeks, you could see it on their faces. It was like, we've never heard the Bible put this way. And I explained that in the first seven centuries, they never heard the Bible put any other way. It was always the old and the new. It wasn't just private interpretation. It wasn't just proof texting. It wasn't just focusing on the end of time and the book of Revelation. It was the old and the new. And so as I was trying to stay ahead of the game, I was always kind of like a week or two ahead in my research than I was in my preaching. But I remember these parallels between Jesus and Moses got a little disturbing. I mean, I noticed the parallel from Jerome that, you know, here is Moses multiplying the loaves, the manna, to feed the multitudes in the wilderness. And what does our Lord do? He feeds the 5,000 with 12 baskets of leftovers. Well, that signifies, that's a symbol of the 12 tribes of Israel. And on that occasion, the people even recognized this is the prophet like unto Moses. But on that occasion, in John 6, I ran into what felt like a brick wall. And I won't go into great detail, but if you have a Bible, turn with me to John 6. Because on that occasion, Jesus is saying, in effect, that Moses gave your fathers the manna, but I am the true bread that comes down from heaven. The bread of life which is given for the life of the world is my flesh. Whoa. Verse 51. That seemed a little out of place. And not surprisingly, in verse 52, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Well, that seemed to be a reasonable question because in the Old Testament, that was not right. <laughs> that was shocking. That was offensive. That was contrary to the law of Leviticus. Little did they know what our Lord was planning to do with Levitical laws. And so here he was speaking in a way that shocked and offended these people who heard him. But I'll be honest, I must have read that text dozens of times, but it never struck me before. I was trying to work it out to figure, how am I going to preach this in a week or two? I was already into John 5. Okay, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I'm only speaking figuratively. <laughs> well, no. Truly, truly, I say to you, I'm using mere symbolism. That's what I expected him to say. I was hoping that he would say, but what he actually said was, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Here they were taking him literally, and he had an opportunity to adjust it and say, I'm only speaking figuratively. And he could have adjusted. He would have, if that's all he intended. And he should have, if he didn't mean it in a plain, realistic, and literal way. And so I'm trying to figure out, okay, wait a second. They just asked you, how can you give flesh to eat, and you just up the ante. You made it even harder to swallow. And then the next verse, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. A third time, my flesh is food indeed, my blood is drink indeed. 
A fourth time he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And I had heard probably two dozen sermons on what it means to be born again. That's what Jesus says in John 3, but he only said it once. Here in John 6, he said four times, my flesh is food, my blood is drink, eat my flesh, drink my blood, I'll raise you up at the last day. I never heard a single sermon. I never even heard a lecture. All we were told is this is ritual symbolism, and everybody knows it, Presbyterians and Baptists and Methodists, except those Catholics, you know, they take it in a kind of superstitious way. And I never really wrestled with it before I was suddenly forced to. And so I did what I was now habituated to do. I turned to the fathers for help. Surely they can help me out on this one, but they only made it worse. St. Augustine, St. Jerome, Ephraim, Cyril, Cyprian, they all seemed to assume that Jesus said what he meant, he meant what he said, and I was trying to figure it out. I could really relate to the disciples in verse 60. Many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? They couldn't even put up with him at that point. It was that shocking and offensive. And so what does Jesus do? He goes on to explain, you know, and I, I thought, well, here in verse 63, the flesh availeth nothing, it's the spirit that gives life. Ah, that's the proof. He's talking about the spirit. He's not talking about his flesh, but as St. John Chrysostom said, he said four times, eat my flesh, drink my blood, eat my flesh, my flesh is food indeed. He says, the flesh availeth nothing. He doesn't say my flesh. Human flesh doesn't, but this flesh of the God-man, this is the mystery of the Eucharist. I even bristled at the word. We called it the Lord's Supper. We didn't refer to it as the Eucharist. What am I going to do with this, you know? Augustine to the rescue. He says so straightforwardly that you can't understand what Jesus means until you notice when Jesus speaks. Because in John 6, verse 4, we John tells us that it was during the feast of the Passover that all of this takes place. It is at the time of the Passover. So Augustine says, you've got to understand the Passover like Jews did. Well, how true that is, because for Jews, the Passover is like, you know, Christmas and Easter and the 4th of July all rolled into one. But for me, it was still sort of like, you know, an Old Testament ritual. So I, I read up on it, and Augustine was preaching up on it, and so I just kind of followed along how when Moses brought about the first Passover, it was very plain and simple. You found a lamb without any blemish and slaughtered it. Then you sprinkled the blood because bloodshed was essential. But the third and final step was the climax. You ate the lamb. You had it roasted. You gathered as a family around the table with your loins girded, ready to flee to freedom under the leadership of Moses in Exodus 12. You had to eat the lamb, and that communion meal was the climax of the sacrifice because it showed that God the Father was restoring his family and feeding them through this sacrifice. And so as I began to sift through it, it occurred to me as Augustine was preaching this that it wasn't enough to slaughter the lamb. It wasn't enough for the blood to be shed. You had to eat the lamb. It was not an option whether you liked lamb or not. If every member of your family voted against it, mama just makes some bread in the shape of a lamb, you'd have awakened the next morning and the firstborn would be dead. You had to eat the lamb. And so for Augustine, Jesus is the lamb who takes away the sin of the world and so he has to die. His blood must be shed, but guess what? One more thing remains. You have to eat the lamb. And so one year from now, Augustine explained to me, Jesus knew what he'd have to do. At his last Passover, he'd have to die and shed his blood. But he'd have to make provisions for a communion. And he did that when he was celebrating the old covenant Passover for the very last time. He wasn't simply celebrating it. He was fulfilling it as the Lamb of God, as the firstborn son who was to take away the sin of the world. He was not only celebrating and fulfilling it, he was transforming it into the new Passover. We call it the Eucharist. Ooh, maybe you do, but I didn't. So for Augustine, eating a mere symbol would never be enough in the old or the new. Wow. I was wondering, what on earth? You know, I could really relate to, in verse 66, after this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went about with Jesus. Because one year earlier, how is this going to make sense? So Jesus turned to the twelve, and he says straightforwardly, do you also wish to go away? He didn't turn and say, come on, you guys know I'm only speaking figuratively. 
He knows that what he said was potentially as shocking to the Twelve as it was to the thousands who departed that day. It struck me. Jesus was not backing down. He must have said what he meant. He meant what he said. And he would risk even losing the Twelve. I love Simon's response. Lord, to whom shall we go? It's like, we've been thinking about it. Can you recommend some other <laughs> rabbi, you know? And it goes, you have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you're the Holy One of God. In other words, Jesus did not hear Peter say, look, those outsiders don't comprehend, but we're the insiders. We do. Hold still while we chew your arms and legs, you know? <laughs> Peter didn't have a clue as to what Jesus meant one year before the ultimate Passover. But it was enough for Simon to put his trust in Jesus. I assume, I trust that you know what you mean, and that's good enough for me. And I was wondering, is that good enough for me? I got up the next Sunday and announced from the pulpit that I was going to terminate the series in John's Gospel at the end of chapter 5. I hadn't been there two months and I, w I didn't want to be fired, you know. And we, we, we had a baby coming in just a five more months and I had a mouth to feed. I had a paycheck. I, I, I didn't know what to do, but I'll be honest, I had to admit that the early church was unanimous. There was an absolute consensus for the first seven centuries, and they all said Jesus said what he meant, he meant what he said. And in the Holy Eucharist, you don't have mere symbolism, you have the reality of the Lamb of God. Whew. This was a new Moses, a new Passover, a new covenant in a way I had never imagined. I began looking elsewhere as I began preaching besides John. I went to Matthew's Gospel, and there in Matthew you not only find Adam and Moses, you also find a lot of typology rooted in the kingdom of David and in the son of David, Solomon, because Jesus is prefigured by Solomon. Solomon is the son of David. Jesus is called the son of David. What did God announce about Solomon? I will be his father. He will be my son. And so here's Solomon, the king of Israel, like Jesus, the king of kings. Here's Solomon giving wisdom to the Gentiles like Jesus did as well. And so I could see not only in Adam at creation and Moses at the Exodus, but Solomon with the kingdom prefiguring Jesus. And so I went into Matthew's gospel, forgot about John, and made all of that come alive. And then after a couple of months, I got a strange phone call. A local seminary, would you teach a course for us this fall on the gospel of John? I said, what about Matthew? No, we need John. And so I came up with an excuse. I said, you know, I would only teach John if all of the seminarians had at least a year of Greek. They, they do. Well, there was my excuse gone out the window. So I said, okay. Reluctantly, I agreed. We got through the first five chapters. And then that fateful week, I prepared them by photocopying sermons from the fathers that I had been reading months before. I photocopied the Greek New Testament so we could deal with the text in the original language. The next week we got together and we got down to it. For two and a half hours we worked through John 6, eat my flesh, drink my blood. We had Presbyterians, Baptists, Methodists, the whole gambit. And at the end I asked them if they had read Augustine and the other materials they all had. And so I said, I want you to spend a week thinking about this then. When does Jesus' sacrifice really begin? Is it at Calvary? Think about that. And this hand shut up. And I know, think about it, spend a week. Oh, oh, I hate that when students do this, you know. <laughs> like, what is it, John? He said, it's obvious, Professor Hahn, the sacrifice didn't really begin at Calvary. It's a Passover sacrifice. He's the lamb. It began in the upper room when he was celebrating the Passover and fulfilling it and instituting the Eucharist. I'm like, that's right. You don't need a week, okay? Then think about this. When does the Passover really get fulfilled? Was it when they left the upper room? Think about that, and his hand shut up again. I was going to ignore him, only he began that groaning and moaning even louder. Everybody was looking back at him, nobody at me. I'm like, okay, what is it, John? He said, this is obvious. He said, the, sacrifice, the Passover didn't end when they left the upper room. The Passover didn't end until Calvary. And I'm like, okay, you got it. Do others see it? And they were all nodding. You can see then that the Eucharist and Calvary are one and the same sacrifice and his hand shut up again. We were over time at this point. I hadn't asked a question. I was intent on ignoring him. Oh, Professor, oh, oh, you know, what was I to do? What is it this time? He said, that's exactly what I learned when I was a kid from the Baltimore Catechism.
Well, you know what he was talking about, but I didn't. I'd never heard of the Baltimore Catechism. I said, you mean the Westminster Catechism? And I assure you, that's not what it teaches. He said, no, I was raised Catholic, and the nuns used the Baltimore Catechism, and that's exactly what we learned. And I'm like, mopping my brow, I'm like, I assure you, that's not what you learned. He said, you ought to look into it. <laughs> well, I went and found me a copy of the Baltimore Catechism. He was dead right, and I was dead scared. I couldn't believe it. They had it exactly right, the old and the new, just like the fathers. It creeped me out. And yet, at the same time, I must admit I was excited because I was anti-Catholic, but I was so much more in love with our Lord and His Word that I would learn, yes, even from Catholics if I had to, but the Baltimore Catechism? Whoa. It was humiliating. So I went through the rest of the course in the Gospel of John and we saw how all seven of the Jewish festivals that give you the outline of John's Gospel are fulfilled. And they could just see the liturgy of the old coming alive in the life and death of Jesus. But it was the liturgy of the Eucharist that the early fathers were showing me and them is where the fulfillment really takes place. I got a call one evening from the chairman of the board of trustees of the seminary. I knew there had been a board meeting and he asked me out to lunch and he was going to pay. And so I think, I'm thinking to myself, I'm in trouble. You know, the word is out. You know, this guy's a closet Catholic. I'm being outed, as it were, you know. So I get together with this guy named Steve. We're at a really swanky restaurant. I'm thinking, what is this? Huge, wonderful lunch, three-course meal. We have dessert. I'm thinking, it's like the mafia, you know, before they rub you out, they fatten you up. I, you know, I didn't want to be terminated this way. But why not go out in style, I thought, you know. So at the end, he turned to me and he said, you know, we had a board meeting on Wednesday. I'm like, I, I know. He said, we had, we had a vote, and it was unanimous. And I'm thinking, unanimous? I thought I had at least two supporters on the board. They turned on me, and he said, we discussed the, uh, the need we have for the dean, a new dean of the seminary. We'd like to extend an offer to you to be the dean of the seminary. And I thought it was joking. I thought, this is sick humor, you know? <laughs> I'm like, you, you got to be kidding. He said, no, I'm not kidding. And I said, I'm, I'm not even 27 years old. I don't have a doctorate. We, well, we, we talked about that. But your teaching in the scriptures is making it come alive. Our enrollment is up. The students are excited in a way we've never seen before. I'm like, I, I, I can understand, so am I. But I mean, I would need a PhD to be a dean. He said, we talked about that as well. I'm like, where would I go? He said, well, there's only one doctoral program in all of D.C. where you can get a PhD in scripture. I'm like, where is that? He said, Catholic University. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I don't want to go there. You know? And so I just heard myself say, Steve, I thank you. I can't believe the honor, but I have to say no. He said, would you at least think and pray about it? I'm like, okay, no. <laughs> I can't explain why, but I, I think I know I have to decline the offer. When I went home, Kimberly, who expected me to get fired, was praying for me. She was waiting at the front door. When I walked in, she braced herself. What did, what did he say? When I told her, that he had extended the opportunity to be, you know, inviting me to be dean. She was delighted. What did you say when I told her I had declined the offer? I thought she was going to slug me. <laughs> you said, what? Why? And I said, because right now, I don't know what to teach. It's, it keeps coming up Catholic. And I, someday I'm going to have to stand before Jesus and give an account for what I taught the people he suffered and died for. And I won't be able to hide behind my professors and say, I just taught my students what I learned when I was a student. And right now, I don't know what I'm going to tell our Lord. I don't know what to teach his people. And instead of slugging me, she came over and gave, gave me a big hug. And she said, I respect your integrity, but what does this mean? Well, within less than two months, I had resigned from the pastorate. I had stepped away from the seminary. We packed up a U-Haul. We moved back to the college town where we had first met and fallen in love. To make a long story short, I landed a job in the administration. For two years, I worked nine to five and left all my evenings free after dinner. We'd play with the now two kids we had. And, and then from about 8.30 p.m. until about 1.30 p.m., I began a study program for more than two years where I systematically read through about 300 books by authors whose names I'd never heard of before, though I graduated with straight A's, Von Baldazar, Daniel Liu, de Lubac, Congar, Garigou Lagrange, Shaban, and others. All of these Catholic authors of the 20th century seem to read the old and the new like the fathers. 
They seem to apply it to the Eucharist like the fathers. They seem to see that the Scripture's home is in the liturgy. They seem to see that Christ is a new Adam, a new Moses, a new Solomon. And this was sort of like matter of fact. And I didn't even hear this from the best and the brightest of my professors and preachers. After two years, I began to think, the Presbyterian Church is not my home forever. I've got to find something that, is, that has tradition, that has liturgy. One night I came out and I read a, a passage from Father Louis Bouillet's book on the spirit and forms of Protestantism. Kimberly was like, that's amazing. That just sounds like you're preaching a year ago. I miss your sermons. I'm like, well, thank you. But this is from a Catholic priest about the Bible and the liturgy. I feel as though God is asking me to consider joining a church with a liturgical tradition, like the Episcopalians. Her eyes got wide. She's like, Episcop Scott, I remind you, I was born and raised a Presbyterian. My dad's a Presbyterian minister, my uncle, and so is my husband. I don't want to be an Episcopalian. And she burst into tears. And I went to hug her, and she's pushing me away. I'm like, whoa, I'm not going to do that again, you know. <laughs> well, several months went by. I forgot the lesson. I was, reading the vac I was reading the documents of Vatican II. I was so caught off guard. I was swept off my feet. This document, Lumen Gentium, on the church, I came out and began reading it to Kimberly. She's like, that's, that's like you're preaching. I, oh, not this again. <laughs> I'm like, just name the author. You've got your master's in theology. Guess what I'm reading from? And she goes, I'm sure you'll tell me. And I said, this is from the documents of Vatican II. Kimberly, I feel like God is asking me if I'd be open to the possibility of becoming Catholic someday. She looked at me dead serious. She goes, couldn't we be Episcopalians? <laughs> you know? At that point, I knew this was really tearing us apart. It was breaking her heart. So when I told her that I had applied to Marquette and Notre Dame for the doctoral program, she was supportive. I got a full scholarship to both. I chose Marquette. We packed up a U-Haul again and moved to Milwaukee, but not before she extracted the promise from me at least five years. You won't do anything rash, will you? I'm like, no, of course not. I've got to do it. I've got to make it look intellectually respectable, you know. So 85, 90 at the earliest, then, maybe then, I'll become a Catholic. And so it was all theoretically possible, hypothetical. But again, to fast forward, to make a long story short, I found myself in the fall semester of 85, immersed in doctoral coursework with the early church fathers, the ancient liturgy. It was amazing. All of them. The Eastern Fathers, the Western Latin Fathers, the Syriac Fathers, the New Adam, the New Moses, the New David, that the church is a whole new humanity. It is the new Israel, the Eucharist is the new Passover. The church is the new kingdom with Jesus as the new Solomon reigning from the... I mean, I was so amazed at how they could make so much of Scripture really coherent and profound I began to wonder how much, if any, of this is still left in the Catholic Mass. I had never gone. I never wanted to go. We had considered it a desolating sacrilege to re-crucify Jesus the way you Catholics claimed. Little did I know that was not what the Church has ever taught. But Lorraine Bettner, in this book that I had read way back in high school, had assured me that that's exactly what the Mass was. It was sacrilege, re-crucifying Jesus. So, you know, I didn't want to go. But now I was wondering, how much, if any, of this is still around? So in the, in the winter, in the spring semester of 86, I got a campus bulletin, and I noticed there was a weekday mass in a basement chapel. And again, to make a long story short, I didn't tell a soul. But I thought, that's so safe. Who would notice me? A couple of old nuns? So right before noon, I, I slipped out of my office, down the stairs, and I took up a position in the back pew expecting to be alone with a couple of nuns, housewives with their kids for their lunch time. Businessmen were coming in. 30, 40, 50 people were there. And then a bell rang, a priest came out. Everybody stood except for me, the, the Protestant in the back. I was just kind of jotting observations. And as the Mass began, immediately what struck me was this is just what Justin Martyr and Hippolytus and the Liturgy of St. Mark had shown me. You have the opening rite followed by the penitential rite, and the assurance of mercy and forgiveness. And then suddenly a lector got up and read from the Bible, from the Old Testament. I hadn't heard the Old Testament read in our church in almost two years. And then a second reading in a weekday Mass, and it too was taken from the Old Testament, the Book of Psalms. And then everybody stood up 
and I heard the gospel while I was sitting there thinking, why are Catholics the ones standing out of reverence for the gospel? How come we never heard of that before? And as I listened to the gospel, it struck me, this is what Augustine used to do. He'd find in some Old Testament text the terms, the words, the promises that Jesus is talking about fulfilling in the gospels. This is a perfect match. And then they sat down and listened to a homily that was over in less than two minutes, leaving at least me feeling very underwhelmed. I'm a, I could take it from here, Father. I could show you what the early fathers would have done with that. I didn't think that was appropriate. And then all the action shifted away from the pulpit or the ambo to the altar. And then I realized this is a perfect match. I've just sat through the liturgy of the Word, the synaxis of the ancient church, and now what, what's about to unfold is the liturgy of the Eucharist. And as I sat there, listening to the Eucharistic preface, and then the prayer, and I heard a Catholic priest pronounce the words of consecration for the first time in my life. He said, this is my body, and when he elevated the host, it was like all of the doubts were just draining out of my heart and my mind. I was at the edge of the pew whispering under my breath, my Lord and my God, it's you, isn't it? That's you. I felt like doubting Thomas. And when he consecrated the chalice, I found myself literally, you know, drooling with this holy thirst for Christ's body and blood, wondering, what is going on here? Well, I was trying to sort it all out. The people began chanting on cue, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Then a second time, Lamb of God. Then a third time, Lamb of God. They dropped to their knees. The priest elevated the host. And a fourth time, I'm hearing, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And suddenly, a light came on. And I turned to the back of the Bible. I looked down on the pages of the book of Revelation, where I knew from years of reading, Jesus is called many things, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, but the one thing he's called there more than all the other titles is Lamb of God, Lamb of God, Lamb of God. In 28 verses, in just 22 chapters, and nobody had ever explained to me why is that the all-encompassing title for Jesus. No other New Testament writer calls him Lamb except John. And nobody had ever explained to me why, and I'm looking at it, trying to figure it out. Lamb of God, they're going forward to receive Holy Communion. I'm turning the pages, and I look down, and I read, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, for God of power and mind. Yeah. You must have memorized Revelation 4, verse 8. <laughs> but it wasn't a proof text taken out of context, because as I'm looking at Holy, 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 I'm seeing Lamb of God, I'm seeing these presbyters up in heaven wearing white vestments where Jesus is standing and they're singing the same songs. There's the Amen, the Alleluia, the Holy, 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 the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God. Suddenly I'm realizing that the text of Revelation that I had struggled with for so long trying to find the Antichrist, trying to find the rapture or the second coming, as I'm turning the pages and all of you Catholics are coming back from communion and kneeling, I'm seeing more and more of the liturgy that I just experienced for the first time in my life. Not only the Amen, the Alleluia, the Gloria, the Holy, 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 the Lamb of God, the white robed vestments, there are candles up there like down here in the basement. And then I noticed that there was also a book, just like the, just like the you know, that lectionary up there. And it was open and proclaimed and then, whoa, John describes an altar up in heaven, the New Jerusalem where Jesus is standing as the high priest, and there are chalices there. Huh. And John describes how they contain wine, but when they're poured out, they become blood. Does any of this sound vaguely familiar to you? <laughs> have you gone anywhere, you know, you have white robe vestments, candles, and altars, and books, and chalices, and you hear the Amen, the Alleluia, the Gloria, the Benedictus, and the Holy, Holy, Holy. I'd never been to Mass. And suddenly, I was trying to figure out where I was. Was I in a basement chapel or in the heavenly Jerusalem? And then it occurred to me, C, both A and B are true. <laughs> I'm in a basement chapel, but we've been lifted up to heaven. I'd heard them say, lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord, and I'm looking down in Revelation 3, and I'm seeing the Spirit being sent by Jesus to lift John up from the island of Patmos, where he was exiled all by himself, so that he could take in the worship of the angels and saints and Jesus said, write it down, take it back, and have them read it. And by the time the people were leaving, after Mass was over, I was so stunned I couldn't budge. For almost an hour I sat there stunned. 
I finally got up. I went home. I was going to tell Kimberly, you'll never guess where I've been. You'll never guess what I've just seen. You'll never guess what book of the Bible now makes sense. She'd kill me. <laughs> so I went, I, I got through dinner. We got the kids down. I went up to my study in the attic. I got out the Greek book of Revelation. I got out the English. I got out the, the early fathers. And until almost 3 a.m., I read that entire book. And it felt like the first time. Suddenly I realized, well, I'd always known the book of Revelation is divided into two halves. Everybody knows 1 to 11, 12 to 22. But I never noticed until that night around 1 a.m. that in the first half of the book of Revelation, all the action revolves around a book that is opened and proclaimed as having been fulfilled by the Lamb, followed by the prayers of the faithful, including the martyrs who had died on earth. They were alive in heaven. Somehow I'd overlooked that. They're praying for us. God is hearing them, sending us help to deliver us. All the action revolves around a book that's proclaimed and then the prayers of the faithful. And then in the second half of the apocalypse, in John's visions, all the action shifts to an altar up in heaven where Jesus stands wearing the white vestment of the high priest with the, the seven golden lampstands, the menorah in the heavenly Jerusalem, the seven chalices that contain wine, they're poured out as blood, and then at the climax of the second half, the angel invites John to, and all the faithful to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb, who's getting married? Well, we know who the bridegroom is. It's our Lord Jesus. But who is Christ's bride? The church. And that night it occurred to me. You know, when I got married, I could have said to Kimberly on our honeymoon what I'd heard that priest say earlier. This is my body which is given for you. Jesus was speaking through the priest to the church as his bride, giving us his own body and blood to renew the new covenant, the marital bond with his bride. And this was the climax of the second half of the apocalypse, just as Holy Communion was the climax. I found in Augustine that night the phrase, marriage supper of the Lamb, which I'd always taken to be a futuristic description of the end of time. He said it's that, but even more, it's just as much a Eucharistic fulfillment every Lord's Day. And he explains that John was in the Lord's Day. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day when he had all these visions. That night I read in Revelation 1-3, Jesus saying, blessed is he who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it read. Now was Jesus blessing the literate and the illiterate? No. He was blessing the lector and the congregation assembled to hear it read. Where did Jesus intend to have all of these visions read? in the context of the Eucharistic liturgy of the first century where all of these visions would come true. Where in the Spirit we'd be lifted up to heaven, heaven would come down to earth, the same songs that the angels and saints are singing, we're singing, the same prayers, the same sacrifice, the Lamb. You'll never guess where I was the next day before noon. <laughs> I still couldn't crack the code of your little missalette, but I didn't need one. I had the apocalypse, you know? I followed along that day, the second Mass. It was so cool. By the time I was over, by the time it was done, it occurred to me. These Catholics, I tell you. You know, the fact is, we all want to go to heaven, don't we? We just don't want to die first. <laughs> but what struck me is that you Catholics don't need to die in order to go to heaven. All you've got to do is go to Mass. And heaven is where you are. Where you are. The angels and saints are who we're with. Our songs, our prayers, and our sacrifice are the exact same. Jesus gave these visions to John and had him take it back, not just for a Wednesday night Bible study, not just for my private interpretation, not just for proof texts, but for the context of the old covenant Passover fulfilled by the Lamb of God, but that fulfillment didn't end in the first century. It's going on in the 21st century in the Mass through the Eucharist every bit as much and I was going back to Mass secretly day after day for two, three weeks, falling head over heels in love with my Savior in a way I never knew before. Wondering how am I going to make it to 1990. <laughs> I mean, that was four years off. I finally had enough nerve to tell Kimberly. She was upset, as I expected. I set up an appointment with a local Monsignor, Bruskowitz. He's now the bishop in Lincoln, Nebraska. We sat down, we talked about all kinds of things, especially the apocalypse. I said, how do you interpret the book of Revelation? He said, not like you, I suspect, as a Protestant. I'm like, try me. He said, well, for us, it's not just futuristic, the end of time. It's also Eucharistic because we go to heaven in the Mass. I'm like, where'd you find that? He said, well, I, you know, the, the book of Revelation. I'm like, yeah. 
and in the early fathers. And he said, but it's funny because this morning in my, my, my morning devotional reading by Pius Parsh, here, look at this, and I read it. In Revelation 4, the morning devotional reading was, you know, that John is describing the heavenly liturgy just as it takes place on earth, as it is in heaven. That in every Mass, every Catholic goes to heaven whether they know it or not. I had just reinvented the wheel. I had handed, I handed the book back to Monsignor. I left thinking, how is it that I tried for years to read the book of Revelation, to make sense out of the visions of John in terms of the Antichrist, the rapture, the second coming, and yet those words aren't used. And yet the only thing that you will find on every page of the apocalypse is what? The liturgy on earth as it is in heaven experienced by John in heaven as it was on earth. And so it occurred to me that the liturgy is the context in which we read the scriptures, and that's when I was reminded of that story. Because for over a decade, I had what you could call a great case of spiritual heartburn. I had been reading the old and the new for years, trying to get my mind around it. My heart was burning within me, but then suddenly what? My eyes were open in the breaking of the Eucharistic bread, just like those two disciples. It also occurred to me that is probably why Jesus suddenly disappeared. He wasn't playing hide-and-go-seek, now you see me, now you don't. Once the faith of those two disciples grasped the real presence of Jesus Christ, resurrected glorified body, in the breaking of the Eucharistic bread, his visible presence was no longer needed. His physical body would have become an impediment to the to faith growing. The whole point of the scriptures, I found, the old covenant is fulfilled by Christ in the new, but the fulfillment doesn't end back in the first century. Through the Eucharistic liturgy, it is continuing down to the 21st century, all over the earth as it is in heaven, with the angels and the saints and the martyrs and the ordinary Catholics who come prepared or not, who might be bored, half asleep, with stinky perfume that distracts us. It just occurred to me, it doesn't really matter whether people, you know, I'm thinking to myself as after you know, attending Mass secretly for a month, Jesus Christ has been here all along. I just didn't see him. Suddenly the scriptures are now coming alive, my eyes are open, but it doesn't make Jesus' real presence any more real than it already was. It just made it much more meaningful to me. Not believing it before didn't make it any less real. It just disconnected me from the powerful and profound fulfillment of the scriptures in the new covenant Passover we call the Eucharist. By then, I had to finally ask Kimberly, do I really have to wait until 1990? She said, you promised. I said one night, I know, but would you pray about releasing me from the promise? She said, would I pray about it? <laughs> That's clever. I'm like, well, she said, no, nah. and she walked away. Later that night, she came back and she said, you know what, I prayed about it. And I'm open to the possibility of releasing you from that promise, but why should I? I said, because, Kimberly, it's coming true. I know it's real. For me to delay obedience to what I know is real feels more like disobedience every day. And she looked and she said, that's clever too, you know. <laughs> so I told her, and she said, okay. But when can you be, when, when, when are you thinking about becoming a Catholic? I said, this Easter, Monsignor will receive me into the church. She said, that, that's less than a month. I said, that's right. And she looked at me and she said, well, I'm coming. I want to I wanna be there and see what they're going to do to you. <laughs> like a car wash or what? I, I wasn't sure what. And so I spent the next several days giving her this crash course trying to help her cram for the Easter vigil, there's going to be the old and the new. Right, yeah. Catholics read the old. I'm like, yeah. And so I told her about the Eucharist and I told her about the fathers and she just could, she couldn't handle that much. I, I went into the apocalypse and that was it. I mean, come on. The book of Revelation, what does that have to do with the Mass? Well, to make a long story short, Easter vigil came and I thought I was ready. But I was, I'd never been to the vigil Mass. I thought there might be one or two Old Testament texts that were read. We sat there with candles in total darkness. There were seven Old Testament passages read, interspersed with a psalm after each one, and they were all interconnected. It was all typological, from creation through the Exodus to the kingdom and Christ fulfilling it as a new Adam. 
a new Moses, a new Solomon. By the time the gospel was read and the homily was preached, Monsignor went to town for not two minutes, but like 20, 25 minutes that went by like two minutes. Kimberly was holding my hand, squeezing tighter and tighter. I wasn't sure if he had offended her. I'm like, what is it? She goes, this is amazing. I've never heard so much scripture. This is beautiful. I'm like, see, I told you this is what, you know. <laughs> the liturgy makes the scripture come alive even for people who weren't ready, like she wasn't. But even more, the scriptures illuminate the mystery of the sacraments that constitute our liturgy. And so when I went forward to receive Holy Communion and I came back, I gave thanks. It was hard because Kimberly was already crying at that point. I, I prayed to Christ for her sake. And I felt him saying, you can't love her as much as she needs you to without these sacraments. I love her more than you ever will, but I want to give you this grace. And I'm thinking, Lord, you're going to have to tell her that. She'll think that's clever, just like all the other things I've been <laughs> telling her. Well, again, to make a long story short, about a month later, I convinced her to have a, a Bible study in our home. Do Catholics do that? I'm like, oh, yeah. She'd never heard of it. I mean, her Catholic friends were like mine in high school. You know, my Catholic friends were the only guys who could consistently outswear, outdrink, you know, and all that. I didn't know any devout Catholics, much less them went to the Bible studies. So we had about 12 undergraduates coming every Saturday afternoon to our living room, which was directly connected to the kitchen. And it was at 4 p.m. because I knew she'd be in the kitchen getting dinner ready. You'll never guess what book of the Bible we tackled first. The book of Revelation. And after a couple weeks, she goes like, they don't know their Bible. I'm like, yeah, that's true. But after five or six weeks, I said, do you notice anything about these kids? They're so excited. I'm like, about what? The book of Revelation. And you know why? And she's like, because it makes more sense for them than it did for us, but it isn't fair. We had the menu, they have the meal. I remember thinking, that is so right. For years, we studied the menu. We were memorizing the recipe with all the ingredients. Well, you Catholics enjoyed the meal. And she said, boy, I sure hope that you help these cradle Catholics get to know the menu better. How much more they'll get out of the meal. Well, I think God has an incredible sense of humor because when 1990 finally rolled around, guess who decided? God was calling her to become a Catholic. Yeah, yeah. Kimberly's impatient husband. He just couldn't wait, but that year Kimberly came into the church and we had the most glorious reunion together as a family and as a married couple. And we're celebrating our 21st anniversary, mine. But I'll be honest, it really feels like, you know, a year ago. It just doesn't get old. It's ever ancient and ever new, as Augustine once put it. But I want to conclude by challenging you, all of you, whether you're cradle Catholics, converts, fallen away Catholics, non-Catholic Christians, to get to know Jesus Christ, the Word incarnate, but to get to know Him by reading and studying the Word inspired. But not simply through private interpretation or proof texts or trying to figure out all the prophecies, but discovering that the scriptures were collected in the third and fourth centuries by the bishops who were celebrating the sacraments and the liturgies of the early church. The scripture is a liturgical book and the Eucharistic liturgy is a scriptural act. Nothing you do will be more saturated with the old and the new every Sunday than the mass. And let's face it, the, the only thing every Catholic is obligated to attend every week, every year, throughout your whole lives is what? It isn't football, it, is, you know, it isn't theater, it, it, you know, it's the mass. Every Sunday of our lives, from childhood through adulthood to old age, and the only book that will be read in every single Mass is what? It isn't the imitation of Christ, as good as it is. It isn't the latest papal encyclical, as rich as that might be. It will be the Bible, and it will always be the old and the new. Hearing the promises fulfilled by Christ in the new, and the fulfillment is going on in every single Eucharist. Our hearts ought to be burning within us. We ought to be preparing ourselves and our loved ones, but we also ought to prepare ourselves for our eyes to be opened in the breaking of the Eucharistic bread. The fulfillment of the old by Christ and the new is going on right now every bit as much as it did back then. The liturgy is what prevents us from becoming spectators. In the liturgy, we are participants in the dramatic work of God our Father 
who is fathering his family through Christ his Son, our oldest brother, in the power of the Spirit, it is the Holy Spirit's work, not the priest, to transform bread and wine into a fulfillment of what Christ promised. If only we have enough faith to take God at his word and we see him keeping his word in every Mass. We're not out to win arguments with non-Catholics. We're out to show our brothers and sisters in Christ for whom Christ suffered and died, who often serve Jesus more generously than we do, who study the Bible more assiduously than many of us. We're out to win not arguments, but we're out to show them where it is that they can find the Jesus Christ that they love and serve in the breaking of the Eucharistic bread. And oh, I tell you, when they come home, it's fun to watch. Fourteen years ago, and I'll promise to conclude with this, I was giving a talk, one of the first times I shared, about Scripture and the Mass. And it was a good-sized group in Cleveland, but in the front row there was a disturbing sight. A classmate from seminary was sitting there with his arms folded in this smug expression like, I can't believe you lost your faith or your mind or whatever, you know. I went through the first talk and he came up afterwards and said, I came for a laugh, but I'll stick around for the second. After the second talk, he said, do you have a minute? We went on a walk. We walked around the block a second, a third, a fourth time. He was pouring out his heart. He was like, I can't believe how exciting Scripture was in these last two hours. You're really dead serious about this Catholic stuff. You are more anti-Catholic than anybody else in seminary. And then he called me about three weeks later, and he kept calling. And within one year's time, he had resigned from his Presbyterian church as a pastor. He was unemployed. He moved down to Steubenville looking for work. We found him some. But it was a trauma for him as it had been for me. After about six months, Mark said to me, we've got to set up a support group in case this happens to others. <laughs> And we did. Kimberly and I worked with Mark, and we, we set up a support group. We called it the Coming Home Network back around 93, just to help others, wondering if the Holy Spirit might lead other pastors and missionaries. And now we have, you know, 13, 14, 15 years later, we have over 800 Protestant pastors and missionaries who have come home. This is Marcus Grodi. This is the, the Coming Home Network. And all of them, all of them testified to the same thing, how much they love Jesus Christ as their Savior, how much they enjoy Scripture, but how it all came to a level of fulfillment that surpassed their wildest dreams and overcame their deepest prejudices in the Holy Eucharist. And that's the meal. This is the menu. And it's time we get serious about reconnecting them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, your eternal Son. You have given us your word, and that word became flesh and dwelt among us, suffered and died for us, rose again and ascended and was enthroned on high, where he sits now at your right hand in glory. And yet that glorious Son of yours comes to us in that glory, hidden under the appearance of bread and wine, through the power of the Spirit. And Lord, what an amazingly glorious gift this is. Forgive us, O oh God, for the times that we have taken such grace for granted and help us to make up for lost time. Help us to take you at your word and really get to know the inspired word and to come to a deeper bond and more intimate friendship, a covenant communion with your incarnate word, our eternal Savior. He has paid a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. And we thank you for inviting us to the treasure of this banquet in every Mass. Pour out your Spirit upon us, enlighten our minds and kindle our hearts, and help us and hear us as we pray that family prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Maria Goretti, pray for us in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know what? I, I, I realize now I went a little over, and I didn't even finish.
If I had time, which I don't, but if I did, I would have gotten into the new lectionary that came out in 1970. We're reading more scripture now than we have, but we're doing it just like they did in the first seven centuries. In 1970, after Vatican II, the revised lectionary came out, the amount of scripture read in the Mass almost quadrupled. Every part of the scriptures, every period of salvation history, and it's all deliberately and strategically coordinated to hear the promises in the old fulfilled by Jesus in the new. And I had an explanation of how it's all broken down, but I just got caught up, and I apologize. But let me just say that all of this is available in a couple of books. One is called The Lamb's Supper, The Mass is Heaven and Earth. You've read it and enjoyed it. Thanks be to God. I, this is really one of the answers to many of our prayers. I've told a few of you that uh, after it came out, I was stopped at the Philadelphia airport by a little boy who said, are you Dr. Hahn? I'm like, yes. He said, you write the Lamb's Supper? I'm like, I did. And did you read it? He said, two times. And I said, how old are you? Eleven and a half. And I wanted to hug him, but I wasn't sure whether to believe him, you know. <laughs> Suddenly his father stood up and spoke, out, spoke up for him. He said, he did. He read it twice, and then he got me to read it. And we've been going to daily mass ever since, father and son. And I just looked at him and I said, thanks be to God, that is the answer to all of our prayers to raise up a whole generation of Catholics who love the Bible and who see Christ in the Holy Eucharist. And so I just want to give God the, the credit for that. But I also wanted to mention that there's a new book out. It's been out almost a, a year now. It's a sequel to The Lamb's Supper. It picks up where it leaves off. It's called Letter and Spirit from Written Text to Living Word in the Liturgy where I explain how the liturgy is the most scripturally soaked experience you will find and how the scripture is soaked all the way through with liturgy from the divine Sabbath in Genesis 1 and 2 to the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation and every time God appears and does something great it's always in the context of God's people worshiping in the liturgy. I really hope this can pick up where the Lamb's Supper leaves off to prepare your hearts and your loved ones for each Mass better and better. I also wanted to mention another book that I just finished recently called Understanding the Scriptures. It was originally designed as a high school text. Uh, Archbishop Chaput wrote the foreword. He had asked me to write the book. He had indicated that there hadn't been a, a reliable text in Scripture for high school cath Catholic high schoolers for four decades. I, I couldn't believe it, but I checked into it, and he was right. So I went to work a year later. I sent off the manuscript, and I wondered, why are they taking forever? And then suddenly, they sent me this incredibly beautiful hardbound book with all of this beautiful artwork, photography, maps, charts, and diagrams. And I couldn't believe the job that they had done, and they kept it under $50. And, you know, I, I was stopped on the streets in Steubenville by this guy named Mike. He said, what are you doing with our, our book there, Mr. Hahn? And I'm like, what do you mean your book? He said, well, that's our book. I'm like, well, I wrote it. He said, you wrote that? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I got to tell my friends, me and my friends were just talking about how it's like the first book that makes the Bible really exciting and our, our faith like comes alive. And I'm like, oh, thank you. Thanks be to God. You know, I got to tell you, the, uh, in, in less than two years, we, we thought that the first print run of 10,000 would last a year. It didn't quite make it a month. We had no idea what an appetite, what a longing there was, not just in the high schools, but in adult education, individual study, group study as well. It's now, I just heard last week, it's in 35% of the Catholic high schools in the U.S. It's part of a four-year series. The publisher is still trying to keep up with the demand. You can't get it on Amazon, new copies in the bookstore. Uh, we do have some copies, and I apologize for not sending enough for a group this size. I, didn't just, I just didn't realize how many there'd be. But I would say if you, if you buy, if you order one today and just pay a couple dollars for postage, I'll be sure to sign them and send them off next week. To, if you're interested for yourselves or for your loved ones or whoever, it's just a great honor and privilege for me to be able to share this, to have discovered it, and then to be able to you know, share it with you. Because however much you enjoy this, I got to tell you, I have more fun than all of you put together. We're going to take a break for like five or ten minutes. I apologize for going over. I'll stick better to the time next, next talk, but we'll gather here in like five or ten minutes, and God bless you.